This is a machine that is familiar to most people in my age group who grew up in the US. This is the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES, the NES. The machine credited with reviving the games industry in the 1980s and ushering in the age of Nintendo mania. For many in the games industry, it is this machine and the games you could play on it that ignited a lifelong passion for games. I was probably around seven when the NES came to my family's home. Given that I'm standing here talking to you about it, you can probably guess that it's had a pretty profound effect on me. Fast forward to 2020 and a global pandemic and a world in lockdown. Those of us fortunate enough to be able to work from home, a privilege for which I'm eternally grateful. It, it was, and it still is, a time when we found ourselves with more time on our hands, yet somehow, paradox, paradoxically, we were busier than ever. Like many in need of a new emotional anchor during the pandemic, I turned to nostalgia. Oldies but goodies, something familiar in an unfamiliar time. Some people binged on familiar TV shows, others took to eBay to collect objects from their childhood. I had a slightly different approach. I went back to a toy from my childhood with the skills I honed as an adult. I decided to make my own NES game. The inception for this idea came from a game jam, a sort of informal game development contest, specifically the Lost Cartridge Jam, a 72-hour jam themed around new games that feel like old retro games. Extra points for authenticity. Well. What could be more authentic than actually making a game for the old hardware? So, I had three days to learn how to program for a NES, do original graphics and sounds, and create a short but complete game. If that sounds reckless, that's because it is. In normal circumstances, that's not something you should be able to do. But if 2020 taught us anything, is that normal is a bit overrated. So yeah, I did it. I learned enough NES programming to do the deed, and I managed to complete an original NES game for the jam. I even managed to take second place. Claps. And while the game I made is simple and derivative, it will run on a NES, and through its development, this game helped me fall in love with the NES all over again. This time as a developer, not just a player. So with this love in mind, I'd like to share some of the idiosyncrasies of, of developing for a NES and what they taught me about living life during a global pandemic. First major takeaway, the NES is old technology. Even during its 1985 launch in, in the US, the NES was far from cutting edge. Nintendo, the company, often adopts a strategy of using kareta gijutsu, or seasoned technology in their hardware. In other words, the NES technology, which was seasoned at launch, goes beyond simply being old by modern standards. It's ancient. To put some perspective here, consider this. The NES's main CPU is an 8-bit processor that runs at 1.79 megahertz. That's a processor that runs at roughly 1 1,500th of the speed of one of the eight CPUs that are on my phone. That same phone, which has six gigs of RAM, has roughly three million times more memory than the NES's measly two kilobytes. Now, running accurate calculations of relative performance is far more complicated than what I've said here, and I'm skipping over mountains of details. But suffice to say, we are dealing in a performance envelope that is several magnitudes lower than modern hardware. That being said, there are some games on the NES that in my opinion, are leagues more enjoyable than most of the games that you can find on your phone. Speed isn't everything, which is why I've learned that it's okay to slow down. As stressful and disruptive as pandemic life can be, it's also a chance to reevaluate the pace of life we've grown accustomed to. It turns out that the company will not fall apart if you're not in the office every day. More often than not, that missed email or missed text message, it'll still be there the next day. Not everything needs to be done now, now, now. 
as long as it gets done in a reasonable time frame, it'll be okay. Game development lives in a world dominated by frame rate. The number of frames of animation a game can display per second. In most scenarios, a target frame rate of 60 frames per second means that a game has about 16 milliseconds to complete all the calculations needed to draw a frame. Going over that 16 millisecond mark means the game slows down, compromising player experience. Because of the NES's severe performance limitations, I found myself needing to carefully manage the number of calculations I did on any given frame. On modern hardware, I can default to updating most, if not all, objects every frame of the game. On the NES, however, I have to adopt strategies to categorize objects and spread their updates across multiple frames. This turns out to be a fairly common strategy in NES development and the source for more than a few bugs. Lesson here, you don't have to do it all at once. It sounds obvious when you say it out loud, but I find it surprisingly easy to forget this. I'm a pretty task-oriented person. I like to see tasks crossed off on my to-do list. I tell people that one of the best purchases I made during the pandemic was a full-size whiteboard where I can write down all my tasks, and I mean it. But I also notice that I tend to beat myself up if those tasks aren't being crossed off as fast as I like. I get frustrated as I see the list of things to do growing faster than the list of things that are done. And that's not entirely fair to myself. Of course the to-do list grows faster. Wanting to do more stuff, that's part of what keeps us alive. But there are, of course, limits to how much you can do on any given day. And not all those days are the same. Some days are a little bit lower energy. You don't want to do as much. That's fine. Let them be. You don't have to finish everything right this minute. If you've ever worked with digital images, you've probably realized, realized how large they can get. Stored naively, a fairly small 512 by 512 pixel true color image weighs in at about one megabyte, 1,024 kilobytes, way more than the NES's modest storage capacities. So how did NES games store their rudimentary, albeit charming, graphics? Unlike modern technology, which stores pixel data as arrays of RGB, red, green, blue values, the NES uses an indexed palette system. Every sprite or background tile on the screen is assigned to one of a fixed number of customizable four color palettes. Instead of storing color data in the image pixels directly, NES graphics stored the number, a value of zero, one, two, or three, of the palette color that they were to use. This system dramatically reduced the amount of data needed to store NES graphics, but it also limited the graphical fidelity, which led to the very particular look of many NES games. Programmatically cycling through palette colors also, also led to iconic effects, like Mario's rapid color changes when invincible. You actually have to jump through some extra hoops if you want to do that on modern hardware. In addition to this, the NES hardware made a distinction between sprites, graphics that you can position arbitrarily, and background tiles, graphics which must be placed on eight pixel boundaries. Both sprites and backgrounds have their own special areas of memory. As their names imply, sprites were made for all the moving objects in the game, while background tiles were made for, well, the background. However, Many iconic NES sequences, particularly large boss monsters, were built with clever repurposings of sprites and background tiles to represent graphics that wouldn't be possible under a strict sprites for moving things, background tiles for backgrounds regime. So what can we learn here? Know your tools, be creative with your tools. In the US, the NES was sold from 1985 to 1995. During this 10-year span, NES games evolved dramatically, due in part to hardware advances in cartridge design, but mostly due to the growing mastery developers had over the NES. They had time to learn the tools available to them and to come up with novel ways to use them. Just as NES game developers mastered creative applications of their limited toolset, 
During the pandemic, we've all had to adjust to limited access to tools and resources that we took for granted. Many of us had, have had to become masters of improvising. Kitchen tables morphing into combination meeting tables, study desks, and craft stations. Spare wood in the house becoming the foundations for a homemade garden box. Computers and game consoles becoming conduits for virtual playdates for our kids. The school lunch break becoming a chance to bond with, uh, with your child over a favorite TV show that you watched while eating. I like to think that the pandemic and the accompanying separation from normal has given us time to better understand the tools we have our, at our disposal, be they physical, intellectual, or emotional. Even as the increasing availability of vaccines will help us gradually return to the old normal, I hope we don't lose sight of what we may have gained in our time with the new normal. Thank you.